please put your hands together for Jeff. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation to um, to talk. Um, yeah, and um, congratulations to the organisers. It's been exceptionally impressive program that they've uh, put together. So I guess today I'm wearing a hat um, as an uh, economic historian. Um, I was asked to give an overview from the perspective of um, economic historians or economists of, on the question of why countries are rich and why countries are uh, poor. And so. So, okay. I want to start out with, I guess, over the years I've seen lots and lots of different graphs as an economist, but if I had to choose one graph which I think is the most important, uh, interesting, sort of profound in terms of understanding the world graph, then, then this would be it. Um, it comes from a data set compiled by the economic historian um, Angus Madison, and what it does is it basically shows uh, Madison's estimates for um, six regions of the world of um, a measure of, of material well-being, the value of economic output uh, per person in each of those regions of the world. And essentially, this graph tells a story of human history in the last three, 2,000 years in three parts. What it says is that for much of the last 2,000 years, at least compared to sort of material living standards today, standards of living uh, around the world were relatively low and uniform. It didn't matter that much whether you were in Western Europe or Latin America or Africa, from the period sort of the year one up until you know, 1700, 1820, you can see all of the lines pretty much overlay each other. There, there, there wasn't much difference in terms of living standards depending on where you lived in the world and by the standards of the rich countries today, living standards were relatively, relatively low. Then this event happened called the Industrial Revolution which started in Britain and other parts of Western Europe about 250 years ago. The persistent application of new technologies in production which allowed Initially, um, countries in Western Europe and also the Western offshoots, the Western offshoots of the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, allowed material standards of living in those countries to start to grow at a much more rapid rate than had been occurring for the last 1750, 1750 years. So by, by 1820, you can see that the purple line and the, the sort of diamond, they've started to move a bit above the other regions of the world, and by 1900, you know, that's happening to an even greater degree. The third stage, which is the stage we're in at the moment, is what's commonly referred to as the Great Divergence. The Great Divergence is this period where the rich parts of the world, Western Europe and the Western offshoots, you can see you know, living standards, material standards of well-being in those parts of the world have increased at an astronomical rate in the last 150 years or so. Whereas living standards in the other four parts of the world, former USSR, Latin America, Asia and Africa, have increased, but with a delay and, and much, more, much more slowly. So today we're in this position where you know, we have huge disparities in income per capita living standards between different um, regions of the, the world. Um, so you can see sort of like um, the Western offshoot sort of up around 35,000, whereas um, you know, if you look at, say, Latin America, down around you know, 5,000, so a factor of seven. If you look at individual countries, so say, choose a country like Singapore and choose a country like Democratic Republic of Congo, look at their differences in income per capita these days, then the difference is obviously much bigger, like a factor of 180. And the thing we know is that you know, those differences matter hugely for the capacity of individuals, the populations in those countries and regions, to live fulfilling um, and long lives. So for example, compare Singapore and Democratic Republic of Congo, at the moment, you know, life expectancy in Singapore about 82 years, Democratic Republic of Congo about 49 years. So just by the accident of where you're born, you know, there's almost you know, a doubling in terms of how long your life 
your life expectancy is. And we know that translates into all sorts of other things like um, incidence of health conditions, education levels, and so on. So Robert Lucas, the Nobel Prize economist, has said that basically he thinks that when you look at a graph like this, there's not really any other problem that you know, should be important to economists. And, and it's pretty easy to agree with him. Let me just give you a couple of other perspectives on, on this. Um, Maybe I'll start. Okay, on this graph. So this is sort of a regional perspective on the Great Divergence. So the areas, like you can see sort of there in North America, which is the, you can think of as being at the frontier of economic development, and it's sort of shaded in black. Then all of the other regions are shaded in different colours, depending on how long ago it was that the US had the standard of living that that, re that, that country has um, at the moment. And you can see there, see there are clear geographic patterns, like you know, the tropical part of Africa, for example. Its you know, GDP per capita in those regions today is about what the US was the, the leader 180, 180 years ago. So to put a time perspective on it, sort of you know, 180 year lag in development. And the other point this graph makes is that is clearly there's, there's regional concentrations of um, you know, the income disparities which, which, which exist. You know, the US, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan sort of being with the darkest shading, the lighter shading in Africa, medium shading in other um, parts. Maybe the next one. Another perspective on this is, you know, the, on the great divergence is that, and this is a point that sort of, I guess, has recently been made as well by, um, I guess, Thomas Piketty and others, but this comes from work by Branko Milanovic from the World Bank. So Milanovic makes the point that back in 1870, if you think about inequality, most of it didn't depend on where you lived. Most of it depended on whether you were sort of a, a noble or whether you're a peasant. Um, that's what determined you, you, your living standards, your status within the country you lived in. Whereas today, you know, obviously class still matters, but, but a lot more is determined today by the location of where you live than was the case 130 um, years ago. Okay, so that's a bit of sort of a perspective on, on, on the existence of these income disparities. So what I wanted to do now is, thanks, is um, yeah, talk to you about how economists think about the causes of economic development. So economists tend to use this measure called GDP per capita as a measure of the material standard of living. So you've probably heard sort of that there are problems with GDP per capita, it doesn't take account of environmental damage, it's not a measure of happiness, doesn't take account of inequality. So there's lots of problems with it. But in terms of getting a handle on cross-country differences in living standards and especially historically, it's, 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 a, good, it's a good measure. Okay, so economists think of GDP per capita as basically, or sort of mathematically, um, okay, as depending on two things, the proportion of the country's population in the workforce and the value of output per worker. And, and of those two things, it's really the value of output per worker where there's the potential for that to increase continuously and continuously. Obviously, you can never have more than a particular fraction of your population in the workforce. You know, you've got age population, young children, people doing education and that. So, so you can increase your material well-being a bit by getting more of your country into the workforce, but really the only way to sustainably increase the value of output is, is or material standards of living is by increasing value of output per worker. And the thing that economists think of that depending on is technology, the method the method that you use to produce, to produce output, sort of. So if you think, why did living standards increase so much in the Industrial Revolution? Well, it was because of new technology. It was, it was because of the invention of steam power. It was the invention of new ways to produce uh, cotton, text, cotton and other types of textiles. It, would be, it was because of new, better ways to produce iron and steel. And then together, steam and iron and steel became the basis for, for, for railway transport and so on. So new technologies, new ideas and ways of producing are basically, to economists, the, the basis of improvements in material standards of living. This is just, and, and so therefore, economists think of differences in 
the use of technology as being the driver of differences in levels of income. So if you want to say why a country is rich and why a country is poor, to economists it's to do with the application of production technologies. And so this gives you an example, sort of, it's the um, kilowatts of electricity uh, put, used per capita in sort of a series of countries. And so you can see we've got the US and Australia, which is sort of, uh, and this is from 1960 onwards, um, comes from a data set compiled by some economists on all sorts of different technologies. The US and Australia at the top, um, Russia and Argentina, sort of, I guess, you know, mid-development um, countries. Uh, below, but sort of above zero. And then Papua New Guinea, you can see, is the grey line, which is virtually sort of coincides with zero, sort of. And you can do this for all sorts of technologies, whether it's sort of use of uh, railways, whether it's today use of computers, and you get a similar, sort of, a similar sort of pattern. So to economists, income differences are all about um, differences in, um, in technologies. Um, so, so then a critical question to economists is, well, how is it that countries get access to technologies? And they usually think of, well, you can home grow technologies or you can import those technologies from other parts of the world. So in other words, you can be a leader or a follower. Most countries in the world end up being, end up being followers, taking te technologies from other parts of the world where those technologies have been developed. So in that sense, the sort of critical question for economic historians about why countries are rich and why countries are poor is, you know, why is it that technologies that can be used to um, produce goods and services, the frontier technologies, why haven't they diffused all around the world? Why is it that the rich countries, you know, basically have widespread application of the most productive technologies for producing goods and services, but that hasn't extended to the poorest uh, countries in, in the world. And there's sort of two approaches that economists have to, um, to thinking about that. One is to say, uh, well, there, there, there's, there's sort of, and both these are basically sets of reasons, sort of. So first perspective is to say, well, look, there's a set of reasons why the technologies haven't spread. One is that some technologies are developed in rich countries and they just don't work in poorer countries. So an example would be agricultural technologies. Lots of sort of new developments in agriculture in rich parts of the world are designed for temperate climates. And they don't work so well in tropical climates, which is a lot of the poorer parts of the, of the world. So it may be that some technologies aren't transferable. Another idea is that technologies are developed in rich countries to suit the prevailing conditions in rich countries. So one of the main perspectives on why the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain was that labour costs were relatively um, high. Costs of coal, because they had a lot of it, were relatively low. So there was a big incentive to develop and apply labour-saving technologies in Britain, which then put Britain on the path to sort of further technological development. Actually, at the time the Industrial Revolution happened, India was ahead, of, was ahead of England as a manufacturing centre. India produced a lot more um, textiles than England did before the Industrial Revolution. Why didn't India become the place where the Industrial Revolution happened? Well, one of the main ideas is that in India there was huge amounts of labour. Labour was relatively low cost. There wasn't the same incentive to, to develop or, or adopt technologies that were labour saving. So sometimes prevailing conditions in countries can have that um, impact. There's also sort of, I guess, the idea that, look, there are just barriers to technologies diffusing. So it may be that education attainment differing between countries means that countries have differential ability to um, apply those technologies. You know, a lot of the times you're importing technologies from other countries and so it's a matter of having the funding to be able to pay for those technologies. And then there have to be incentives for entrepreneurs to, incest, to, to invest in and apply those, those, new, uh, those new technologies. And so there may be you know, conditions about property rights, um, uh, legal systems in countries that differ that um, uh, you mean that incentives to invest in technology differ between countries. Um, the other perspective um, 
is that there are these fundamental drivers of development, and that's what influences you know, whether technologies get applied in different countries. Um, and so these fundamental drivers, I guess the main two that are usually thought of are geography and institutions. So, so geography is sort of, you know, everything we think is being sort of preordained um, about a country or a region. You know, temperature, rainfall, um, access to river systems, whether it's, whether it's landlocked, whether it has good ports, whether it suffers from a lot of natural um, disasters or not, what the disease environment um, is. And so one idea is that uh, the, the geography in a whole variety of ways may affect um, the capacity of countries to apply um, new technology. So, you know, for example, if you're in a country where the, the disease environment means that life expectancy is low, then that may reduce incentives to invest in education and you know, having a lower skilled workforce may reduce the capacity to bring in and apply um, new technologies. Or as I mentioned before, you know, the fact that um, new technologies in rich countries in agriculture are developed deliberately for temperate climates, that may mean that those technologies don't, don't, um, can't be applied in uh, poorer countries. So geography is seen as one of the fundamental drivers of development. Another fundamental driver is, um, is, is, instit is institutions, which I'll say something uh, more about on the final slide. But there's other, I guess, ideas of fundamental drivers as well, which is um, countries with differing policies, culture, or uh, being connected to success. This is the idea that some countries like Australia have benefited, uh, benefited a lot from um, having been um, colonised by one of the um, by one of the frontier developers of the time. And that made it much easier for technologies to spread. The fact that Australia, through European colonisation, had this connection to the successful part um, of the world. So, let me just finish up by saying something about more about institutions. Because institutions is really, I guess, you know, where um, most of the emphasis has been with economic historians thinking about causes of development um, uh, recently. And, you know, for example, you, know, you might know of Deron Asimoglu and Jim Robinson's book, Why Nations Fail, which is basically all about, you know, the case for thinking that institutions are the main um, reason why countries become rich and countries become poor. When we talk about institutions, what we're talking about is, is basically humanly devised constraints that, that shape behaviour. So this is things like, um, you know, the type of political system you have, the type of um, legal system that you have, um, norms of behaviour that you have, um, cultural approaches to, um, to, to, to behaving. Um, the reason institutions matter is that you know, they influence a whole lot of things that are fundamental about development outcomes. So they influence the, the, the amount of society's resources that end up being expended on determining who has power. So if you have like a stable political system, with regular elections and that, so that you can you know, change um, who's in power in, in a way that's low cost, then the, and that's not disruptive to economic development in the country, then that's actually obviously good. Whereas if you have sort of a political system where it's disputed who's in power, where who's in power is determined through um, resource costly exercises like um, civil wars, where the political rulers end up lacking legitimacy because of um, the way in which they've been put in power, then that's obviously a negative for, uh, for economic development. Institutions determine the extent to which policies are generated that reflect the, public, reflect the public interest. So this is, for example, the accountability of government, the extent of franchise. So that we know in regions of the world where there are narrow franchises, where, say, it's just the top 10% of property owners who are in power, Compared to places where there's a much broader franchise, we know that you're much less likely to get things like public education systems, you're much less likely to get um, land allocation systems that allow general access to land ownership. So, so accountability, um, the extent of franchise are really important aspects of institutions as well. And obviously incentives determine the structure of incentives in society. If you've got secure property rights, so you're an entrepreneur, you know that, wow, if I go out and I invest in this new technology and it turns out to be profitable and I get the returns, then you have an incentive to invest in that way. 
Whereas if you're somewhere where there's not secure property rights and you worry that, wow, I could set up this business, but then you know the dictator's brother's gonna come along and tell me, wow, this is a really good business, I'm gonna take it over um, from you, then that reduces the incentives to um, undertake um, that type of, uh, to undertake entrepreneurial activity. So incentives in a whole variety of ways are thought of as, um, as really critical. So just to reiterate, so I guess, the Great Divergence is, is, the, is the story about um, that's led to countries being rich and poor today. Economists think of that Great Divergence as fundamentally being associated with those different countries applying to different extents the technologies that we have available to produce goods and services today. And economists have these perspectives for thinking about why technologies differ, but think about issues like, well, are there barriers to preventing these technologies getting to poorer countries? To what extent might those barriers be geographical or institutional or policy related within those countries? Yeah. Um, we might just jump in there. Unfortunately, that's some super fascinating stuff, Jeff. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have time for just the top question. So what are some of the current ways people are trying to diffuse technology to developing countries um, that are shown to have a significant impact on their, their economics in a, in a good way? Um, well, I guess there, there's, 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 there's different viewpoints on sort of what, um, you know, on these fundamental drivers. So there are, there are some people like Jeff Sachs who think that, like, basically geography is the, more, the most important fundamental driver. There's Asimov and Robertson who say it's institutions. There's Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo from the Jamal um, Poverty Lab who, who think it's all about policy, sort of. So, I guess th there's really a whole variety of, um, of ways in which um, you know, uh, development economists are exploring ways to improve technologies and it kind of all comes back to what they think the driver is. So you know, Jeff Sachs, I guess you know, has the idea of the, the Millennium Goals and setting up um, the, you know, for, it's very important to have foreign, foreign aid and the um, trial villages you know, under the Millennium Goals that he's established. Um, Banerjee and Duflo, um, what they're doing is sort of running a whole lot of randomised trials around the world to find ways to improve, improve policy making. So doing randomised trials on things like how do you get, give families better incentives to um, bring their kids along to villages to get vaccinated in um, India. Um, or how do you give businesses in India an incentive to adopt technologies that um, are most um, pu pu that have lowest pollution uh, pollution emission? Um, so, so there's a whole there's a whole variety of ways in which that's sort of happening, I guess, and it's and it's the way in which it's happened probably guided by the um, the philosophy of the of the people doing it about what's the main what's the main driver uh, of economic development. Yeah, so like anything in economics, it's a complex question, and there's no simple answer, unfortunately. Um, well, I guess each of those. I mean, I think one one thing to be aware of is that is that there are kind of people who push the idea that there's just one reason for um, that, that that it's either geography or institutions or policies. I mean, it, to me, sort of, it's about all of those things. Sort of, you can really only understand economic development. You know, if you want to understand why is Australia a rich country, Australia's a rich country because we got really lucky geography sort of in terms of you know, mineral resources, in terms of the ability to produce agricultural products like you know, wool when the industrial revolution was going, you know, was, was taking off. But, but Australia has good institutions, stable institutions as well, and Australia's usually done pretty well in policy, in policy making sort of. So, Countries, you know, I guess, are rich because they have a lot of things going right for them. Countries tend to be poor because they have geographic disadvantage and because they have sort of poor institutions. So, so I think it's important to sort of you know, take a holistic approach to thinking about the causes. Great. Well, please join me in thanking Jeff Holland.